This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session of the APS State Grantee Meeting. We are happy to have the opportunity to host this year's grantee meeting virtually, as that provides states with the ability to include as many staff as they choose. I am Leslie McGee, a member of the APS Turk staff with WRMA Incorporated. Today's session is the third of four webinars that we are presenting this year, and our subject today is multidisciplinary team models. The National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System, NAMERS, and the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, the APS TARC, are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the U.S. government. A little housekeeping before we start. Because we are using GoToMeeting, we are asking that everyone keep their microphones muted unless you are speaking in order to reduce the background noise. Also, we are asking that only presenters use their webcams to minimize distractions during the presentation. Thank you. Today's presenters are Zach Gassimi, an assistant professor of family medicine and gerontology at Keck School of Medicine, University of Southern California. His research focuses on securing a basic quality of life for older adults, specifically within the areas of elder abuse, economic security, and the provision of health, social, and protective services. Our second presenter is Dr. Julia Rowan, a postdoctoral scholar at the USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology, University of Southern California. Her research, research interests are evaluation of elder abuse, interventions, focusing on multidisciplinary and person-centered approaches. And at this time, I am going to turn the presentation over to Zach. Thank you very much, Leslie. Hello, everyone. Um, it is wonderful to see so many familiar faces, or familiar names, I should say. No more seeing faces. Um, can you all see my screen? I think you probably can. Yes, we can. Okay. I thought I had in presenter mode. Okay, there we are. Um, well, it's really wonderful to be able to be here and present to you all today. Um, thank you to the TARC and to ACL for extending the invitation to Julia and myself. Um, we are very excited to chat about um, this fantastic project that ACL was um, was generous enough to fund uh, and saw a need for in the field. Um, we had heard that there's a lot of uh, a lot of MDT work going on within the APS enhancement grants this year. Um, so hopefully this will be of, uh, of relevance and interest to many of you on the call. Okay, so uh, throughout the course of the next hour, where Julie and I will be uh, trading off about halfway through, we'll jump between lecture and discussion or uh, asking questions. Um, it, we have a few key points where we're going to stop and ask a few questions, but if there's anything uh, where you feel like you need clarification as we go through, feel free to uh, jump in, come off mute, and, and uh, chime in. We would love to, love to answer the questions as we go so that uh, everything's clear as we're going through, this, through the presentation. Um, we'll, I'll start out by giving a brief intro into Elder Abuse MDTs. Um, talk a bit about existing sports and resources that are out there for MDTs. Hopefully, um, most of you are familiar with them at this point. Then we'll talk about the national survey that we did of MDTs, the Elder Abuse Forensic Center model, um, how we defined success, and um, I'm sorry, how the study showed the teams to find success, uh, and what the barriers have been to MDT implementation uh, and operation. Um, and then a few, actually we're not calling them emerging practices, but uh, interesting practices that we'll come to at the end. A lot to get through in an hour, but uh, hopefully we can breeze through it and leave some time open at the end for, uh, for a bit of a rich discussion as well. So uh, before we jump into too much of the actual lecture content, I would love it if you all could open up the chat and um, type in your response to this question. So just really simply, does your APS enhancement grant involve MDTs? Are they central to the grant? If so, press A and press send. Um, if they're tangentially involved, press B uh, or 
for a node just to see and send. Okay, no so far. Hopefully there are some yeses. <laughs> Okay, stakeholder and community outreach, great. Oh, okay. All right, so Heidi, Rebecca, Kate, and Mariah. Oh, great. I didn't realize you were doing that, Mariah. Okay, got a good number of answers there. Thank you all. Um, we'll have a couple more of these multiple choice things as we go through, and then again, more. Uh, actual discussion later on. So it sounds like we do have a few um, where they're central to the grant, uh, a couple of tangential, um, but hopefully most of you are familiar with the idea uh, by from seeing it in your community. If not, uh, at the end of the next hour, you certainly will be. So just to introduce the idea of MDTs briefly, uh, MDTs, multidisciplinary collaboration through a team model, has been used across the health and social services, um, for a long time now. Um, they started out in more of the health realm and they've migrated over to social, social services. Looking back at the, um, the adult protective and elder abuse literature and record, we can see reference to the team model using multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches going back to the White House Conference on Aging back in 1961, the first one that was held. The value of of the multidisciplinary team model and the interprofessional collaboration through this MDT model is they can be used to expand and enhance the disciplinary perspectives uh, that are brought to any one case. So we know APS is, we don't tend to call them the frontline worker, but um, the, the first response, I'm sorry, we don't call them the first responders, we call them the frontline workers typically, um, that are responsible for coordinating the investigation and service delivery but there are so many, as you all know, so many stakeholders involved in resolving cases of abuse um, and setting in place services. So having this MDT as a consolidated source for bringing together the vast range of uh, professionals that are typically involved in uh, handling those cases can be very useful. Um, one important distinction here when we're thinking about MDTs is the specific type of MDT. I'll go into a bit more detail in a second, but broadly speaking, um, MDT is a very all-encompassing term. So the original MDTs were more based on individual casework where you would have, let's say, a, um, a physician, a psychiatrist, and a social worker working together to resolve a case of elder abuse. Um, that's more of a, a clinic hospital-based MDT that we tend to think of nowadays. You also have, um, as a slightly more macro version of that, what we refer to as case review MDTs, where you will get a group of people convening on a regular basis typically, um, who look over cases and review cases that are in the system. But not to do specific casework on any one case necessarily, but more so to bring together um, a bunch of professionals to discuss the case, as opposed to working directly with clients. And then there are some MDTs that are even more macro, where they won't necessarily do case review, but they'll more so talk about the issues a bit more broadly. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, we're specifically focusing on case review MDTs, which we tend to find as the, uh, are the most prominent um, and probably the most relevant for APS's work. So in terms of the existing, um, existing supports and resources for MDTs. There are actually a lot of things out there that are currently provided by, um, by the federal government and our federal partners. So currently, um, the, two, the two key resources that we think of in our work are offered through the Department of Justice. The first one's been around for probably four or five years now. It is offered through the uh, Department of Justice's Elder Justice Initiative. It's the MDT Technical Assistance Center. They have a dedicated TA advisor, Talitha Gwyn Schaefer, who used to be actually a, um, an MDT coordinator in San Francisco. Uh, they're there intended to provide tools, resources, et cetera, for MDTs across the nation. Um, they're a great repository for best practices, for uh, sample documents, 
and they can provide individual consultation, uh, tips and tricks, all sorts of things to both help start up MDTs and also to help them function optimally once they do get off the ground. Additionally, more recently, uh, within the Department of Justice, OVC, the Office of Victims of Crime, started up a, um, a training and technical assistance center. This, uh, this grant specifically was intended for what they call EMDTs, Enhanced Multidisciplinary Teams. This training and technical assistance center provides training and TA to a specific number of teams that have been funded through an OVC funding uh, mechanism. So uh, this group of, of service providers is coordinated and led by the New York City Elder Abuse Center by Risa Breckman there, who I'm sure some of you are familiar with, uh, but it's a partnership of various service providers around the country. Um, and they're providing robust re uh, responses to elder abuse um, the funding mechanism's goal is to provide res robust community responses to elder abuse through strong and sustainable EMDTs. Um, so there are currently 13 MDTs that are being funded under this mechanism and that are being serviced by the training and TA center, um, but OBC is hoping to expand and fund some more in 2021. In addition to all of this, um, which is the uh, the focus of Oh, I'm sorry, I should cover this first. Um, the broad areas of training and TA that are provided by the OVC funded um, center run the gamut of what you see on the screen here, um, both the strategies for operations and case consultation, providing some direct training to professionals. Uh, the goal was to have a, an in-person convening. We'll see how that goes over the next year. Hopefully we can still have it. Um, as well as guidance on integrating specialty services into the MTT's operations. Um, these are things like uh, forensic accountants, um, neuropsychological evaluators, um, and allied, allied professionals along, the, along those lines. Additionally, the team, uh, the TA and training center is providing strategies for trauma-informed and culture-responsive interventions, and advice on sustainability, which uh, we'll talk much later in the in the presentation can be a, a huge barrier for uh, for six successful operations for MDTs. So, um, in addition to those more direct service technical assistance centers, ACL, um, as I mentioned before, was interested in looking into the Elder Abuse Forensic Center model. That's a model of MDT that has been mentioned in statute. Uh, it was actually included in the Elder Justice Act and therefore um, is the focus of some attention at the federal level. So the objectives of this research study were really to find out a bit more about the Elder Abuse Forensic Center model, but really about MDTs more broadly. The objectives were specifically to inventory and survey Elder Abuse MDTs, to conduct site visits of forensic centers and to survey the members of the forensic centers, um, as well as other MDTs, and also to develop and disseminate specific prog products uh, about the forensic center model and about MDTs more broadly within the elder abuse sphere. Uh, in terms of specific products and outcomes, planning to improve knowledge, um, help understand best practices and model implementation, and to improve the understanding of the feasibility of widespread replication, specifically of the forensic center model, but really more broadly about the replication of uh, MDTs targeting elder abuse and um, as I know, as Mariah would remind us, uh, APS is about more than just elders, more than just older adults. Um, these MDTs do tend to serve uh, younger adults with disabilities as well, um, even though much of the focus has been on older adults. So a brief high-level um, glimpse of what we found through that initial step, that initial survey, we found that there were 324 elder abuse MDTs nationwide. Um, you can see that they were spread fairly broadly around the, around the country with specific concentrations in California, uh, New York had a, a fair few, and then Minnesota and Wisconsin in the middle of the country. So California and New York, there's been a lot of attention to MDTs within the elder abuse world for, for many, many years now. So a lot of them have developed in those two states. Of course, two of the most popular 
populous states in the union as well. So perhaps not too surprising that there is a, there is a high number of uh, elder abuse MDTs there. In terms of Minnesota and Wisconsin though, the reason that we saw so many MDTs there was that those states actually have requirements, mandates for the counties to have elder abuse MDTs in place. Um, so many states, as of the time that we did the survey, which is back in 2018, uh, many states had put in place mandates for their counties to start up elder abuse MDTs to look at, um, at cases of elder abuse. Oftentimes those, um, those aren't funded mandates, which is challenging, um, but those states are doing it anyway and they're putting these MDTs into place on the ground. Um, again, we'll talk more about sustainability and funding downstream. But this was the, broadly speaking, the spread of MDTs across the nation. So with that behind us, time for the second question in our list. Um, so you, uh, your experience, we're curious to hear about your experience. Um, just as an initial question with regards to that, have you participated in MDTs yourself in the past? Have you been either a regular team member? If so, go ahead and press A in the chat box and send that in. Uh, if you've attended occasionally, press B in the chat box and send that in. Or if you've never attended or participated in an MDT, go ahead and do C. And Mariah, very happy to see that I made your afternoon. Okay. Regular occasional attendance so far. Wonderful. Okay, great. So I'm not seeing any C's yet. That's a great thing. So everyone, it seems, or at least everyone who's responded so far, uh, has participated in MDTs, uh, at least occasionally, if not been a regular team member. Hopefully those were valuable experiences for you. Um, we would love to hear a bit more about that at the end of the presentation. So with that behind, I think I will transition over to Julia Rowan um, to see uh, or to tell us a bit more about the specific findings from the study. Julia, are you there? Yeah, really good. Thank Great. you, Zach. Let's take it away. So the, sl the slide you're looking at now is showing of the respondents that, res that uh, we heard from um, who were some of the most common MDT professionals in the MDTs they had experience with. So of those 324 MDTs, APS was a member of every single one of them, 100%, uh, which is probably a wise choice. I'm not sure how far they could get on their work without um, participation with APS. And it's also likely that APS was a founder of many of these teams. Other common members we found were law enforcement, case management professionals, medical professionals. Um, this represents non-physicians. Uh, just an aside, it didn't make it to this graph, but about 20% of the teams had physicians who were in regular attendance. Um, there are also quite a few that had prosecutors and victim advocates, about 63% uh, of the teams. Okay, next slide. We asked participants, what is the most valuable aspect of attending an MDT? Most people said the case reviews were the most valuable, followed by networking. Um, and to a lesser degree, people were interested in the educational presentations, the program planning, and also follow up on previously presented cases. At this question, they were only asked to select one, so they had to choose the most, most valuable aspect. Next slide. From the perception of the survey respondents, um, MDTs do improve client outcomes. They also reduce recurrence of subsequent reports to APS, and they reduce overall reoccurrence of elder abuse. And 79% of the respondents said that participation in that MDT changed the way they approach um, working with elder abuse victims. Next. Okay, so this information came not from the survey, but from some site visits we did. We went, we visited four teams that were 
known for being very high, high functioning teams. And we asked them for more in depth information about what benefits they saw in participating with the MDT. Now, as you remember on the, the last slide, formal educational presentations was only considered the most essential activity by 10% of the respondents. But what we found in the site visits was that case discussions and networking, which were the two most essential MDT activities, were sources of really rich learning. Most of most everybody we spoke to, we did focus groups and interviewed managers, they mentioned over and over how crucial these teams were for their own professional development and learning about elder abuse in general. So education is a central aspect of these ed, uh, MDTs. And most of this is achieved through hands-on experience rather than um, a passive presentation, listening to someone and watching slides, kind of like what you're doing now. Um, so I think that's really telling as far as the, um, the type of learning that is happening in MDTs. Another huge benefit was um, the value of having access to professionals from different disciplines so people could learn more about these different ways of looking at elder abuse, learn more about the tools that are out there and do their jobs better and be better in helping victims. So uh, people spoke over and over about this broadened view of elder abuse through their work in the MDTs. Um, they also said they were better informed on elder abuse in general and the role of these agencies. And most specifically, they enjoyed hearing about the realities of each professional. Everybody came in with a perception of, say, what law enforcement is supposed to do and what APS is supposed to do, but they loved hearing the realities of this is who we can see and this is what it works, this is how it works um, when people, when uh, victims are seen by our agency. So this implies that people have perceptions of other agencies, like I just said, was clarified through their work with the MDT. Overcoming silos was also really important. Agencies were aware of what the other professionals were doing to help the victims, and therefore there was um, no duplication or people even working against each other or gaps in the case planning. Similarly, efficiency was a key benefit. Uh, one person said, actually a lot of people spoke about this, but one person had a great quote about, you know, it, I come to this MDT and I'm able to do in five minutes, what would take me normally about five to 10 phone calls. I can do it in one conversation by being at the MDT meeting. Another really important benefit was having the support of the team for difficult cases. Now, when I talk about support, this is both task related, meaning um, people appreciated having help from other professionals to help the victim and attend to various aspects of the case, but also emotional support. People described, MDT um, members described the value of knowing that there was a whole group of people of really smart professionals looking at this case and knowing that even in those cases when there wasn't much that could be done, that no stone was left unturned. Um, and additionally, caseworkers, a few APS caseworkers said it was really helpful for them validating their work that they had done a, a good job with the case. There wasn't more that could be done. Um, and it just, it made them feel better about their work that they um, had done thus far for that client. Next slide. Okay, oops. So this, I think is maybe some of the most exciting bits of what we found. So we, we sought to classify MDTs to find out which ones are the highest functioning, those we're calling elder abuse forensic centers. Um, and we found that there are six characteristics that qualify teams for being these very high functioning teams. Now, I think this is so interesting because teams have been anecdotally characterized by specialization. For example, what types of abuse they're looking at, uh, maybe it's a FAST team or fatality review team, uh, which then informs who is at the team. Um, sometimes teams are defined by where they're housed, like if, are they in a medical center, is it social services that's housing the team. But what we found is the real difference is not who is there or what the team focus is, but it's how they do it. So really key is that level of involvement and collaboration and working together on cases. And these six 
characteristics are what it takes to do that. Um, so as Zach mentioned, all of the teams in this study did case review. They conducted it on some level or another. The highest functioning were those that had this robust process of case review, action planning. They met at least twice a month. Um, and then there was accountability for the cases that they reviewed, which means that there were formal recommendations that were decided on by the group. And those formal recommendations were documented in some way so that people who were involved in the case would know what it was they were delegated. The strongest indicator of what made an Elder Abuse Forensic Center was the um, follow-up. And it's interesting, this is a piece that a lot of members really appreciated, was being reminded, hey, did you do that thing that you'd say, you said you'd do? Do you need anything? Do you need any support to do that if you haven't done it? Also important was um, tracking success. And what this means is that the team is looking at outcomes they're thinking about outcomes. They're making decisions on how they intend for their work to impact victims. They're collecting data and they're looking at those results. Doing all of this required a dedicated staff. This is kind of the, the glue that brings all of these activities together is having a person to coordinate and oversee. Uh, this doesn't mean there was necessarily outside funding that was obtained specifically for the MDT coordinator. In fact, only half of the teams that met this classification had funding for the MDT. But what we saw from the site visits was that leadership from one or several of the core agencies prioritized the team enough to designate an employee to provide oversight for the team. Next. Before I move on to the next one, uh, let me just chime in with yeah. one brief definitional thing. Um, so as Julia mentioned, we are uh, we're calling the more robust teams that we're finding uh, through the study Elder Abuse Forensic Centers. Um, that's a, a term that originated in California, uh, where Julia and I are based, and where much of the historic evaluation work on these Elder Abuse MDTs has taken place. Um, there are various models around the country that have sprung up with different names. Um, as I mentioned before, the enhanced MDT or EMDT model um, that originated in New York City through NYSEAC, uh, the New York City Elder Abuse Center, and various other models around the country. Um, we use Elder Abuse Forensic Center more so as uh, just a unifying term for this project, um, not to say that uh, any team that doesn't call itself an Elder Abuse Forensic Center can't be as robust or um, should change its name to, uh, to call themselves an Elder Abuse Forensic Center to, um, to meet that robustness uh, criterion. Um, additionally, the, the Elder Abuse Forensic Center classification in some ways refers to the organizational structure within which these MDT meetings can occur. Um, so perhaps the, the structure that could employ a staffer or that could oversee the uh, case follow-up um, while an MDT operates as one of the activities uh, under the umbrella of that, um, of that center. So with that being said, Julia, I'll skip over to the next slide. Yes, thank you so much for making that distinction, Zach. Um, it was, it's a classic case of a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And um, actually, with, within the analyses, those 26 teams that we found that um, were classified as these high-functioning teams, um, there were a number of different types of teams. There were those that called themselves forensic centers, those that called themselves enhanced MDTs. There was a FAST team in there. Um, there was a task force in there. So I think the, the name is not so important as far as this research is concerned as the functions that they do. Okay, and this slide first, I want to apologize for all of the numbers. This is too much for a PowerPoint slide. I understand you'll get copies of this. So if you want to pour through the numbers, you'll, you, you will have the time to do that later. What's most important here that I want to bring your attention to is um, this is essentially a list of success indicators that MDTs are using in order of 
what proportion of teens are using them. So on the left of the slide there, you'll see indicators of success. And from top to bottom, these are the ways that um, teams thought it was important to measure success. These include both outcomes, which is the change in the client or victim, and also outputs, which is the things that the team is doing, the, the specific interventions that they're employing. So top of the list is decreased level of risk to the client. From there, improvement in the client's quality of life, uh, prevention of recurrence, improvement in the client's health status. And then from there, you get into more of the interventions, such as application of legal remedies, um, housing services, improvement in mental health status, which is an outcome. And I, I won't read all of those to you, uh, but this is generally the way teams are thinking about how they can demonstrate their team is successful. Next. There we go. Sorry about that. So when, <laughs> so when we did the site visits, we had a, we had the chance to have you know really rich conversations about what success meant to these teams. And when MDT managers told us there's different levels of success, there's the victim success, the professional successes, and then there's the team successes. And that is a perfect segue into the next slide. Um, on different ways of looking at success of these teams. So we found out, in addition to client outcomes and interventions, that creative problem solving is a huge success, getting solutions on difficult cases, um, having access to more tools and information to help clients, being able to call people on cases outside the meeting that they've gotten to know through attending the MDT. And in cases when people couldn't fix the problem with the case, Success was viewed as knowing that they had looked at all possible options in helping that person. And even further from that, some teams said that a success was using the cases that demonstrated system gaps or service gaps, you know, those cases where you bring it to the team and there's not much you can do. They said success was the group having awareness of that service gap and then using that awareness to move forward in developing other programs or drafting legislation, thereby reducing gaps. So what this means, the way we're in, what I would interpreted this as, and anybody's welcome to bring up other views in our discussion at the end, is that it takes a lot of effort and intention to develop an MDT. What we're looking at here in, is these team successes. These are process successes. This means the team is working well and that people are viewing this as a specific success that they're excited to talk about with researchers who come to visit them means that this, it takes a lot of effort to make these things happen. And I think that that, we think that that's pretty notable. Next. Okay, so some barriers. We also talked about barriers both in the site visits and in the surveys. So this is a list of the survey respondent sense of the top barriers to establishing MDTs. And they were asked to um, uh, check off any of the barriers that they had experienced so they could select more than one and, and top which is no surprise <laughs> based on previous uh, literature on MDTs is that funding and resources were a major barrier followed by time commitment which is related to resources and then also agency and member engagement so just getting agencies to say yes I will come to this team and sustaining the individual members who have come in continuing to participate in the team was difficult. A quite a few said no major barriers were observed. And then also there's some barriers related to information sharing, um, leadership, the organization of the team. And I just wanna note is, as we talk about barriers that as we did the site visits, um, we had some really interesting conversations about how people were addressing these barriers in different regions. Um, for example, we just I just described how benefits potentially expand beyond helping the victims and may actually improve the agencies who participate. And we saw some teams that used that rationale to go to management in organizations to get their commitment to this teams by telling them if you're 
employees come to this team member, they're going to learn a lot, they're going to be more connected, they're going to be more resourceful, and they'll be able to take this back to their organizations to share it with their coworkers. In essence, your whole organization could um, have be more efficient and more productive. That is a effect, an effect that we have seen in teams that we visited. Next slide. Oh, okay, another question. We would love to hear from you. If you have been involved in starting up or operating an MDT, what challenges have you experienced? And we invite you now, if you'd like to come off mute or you can enter a response in the chat box. And if it turns out that uh, no one has been involved in starting up or operating an MDT and has seen challenges through that lens, um, if any of you, since we know many have participated in MDTs now, if any of you had, have seen some challenges to an MDT operating from the outside and want to chime in with that, we would love to hear that as well. Mm. Mm. Yes, yeah, so we see virtual meetings in rural communities from Rebecca. Absolutely. Funding resources and state sustainability from Mariah. No question. Information sharing, Amber, that's a really uh, great and important one. Um, one that's received a lot of attention um, and one that can be immensely challenging, particularly considering the players around the table, um, both the, the combination of individuals from public organizations uh, and public agencies, as well as for some teams, people from from private industry or from private for-profit organizations, um, or even just non-governmental nonprofits that make information sh sharing a bit more challenging. Um, additionally, uh, there's the the challenge of sharing information with prosecutors that could potentially be ultimately detrimental should a case go to prosecution. Um, and ensuring that that the actual process of bringing bringing a case to the MDT doesn't end up being detrimental to the, the processing and resolution of the case, if it is a case that is appropriate for prosecution. Um, and then Michael mentioned funding and getting all to come to the table. Absolutely, fostering that engagement um, can be a challenge. Um, as Julie was saying, there are some. Uh, some really interesting practices that we see is is promising um, that I think we'll get to in just a minute. Okay, not hearing any uh any other thoughts on challenges or experiences? Uh, I think we can probably move on to the next one, Julia. Does that sound good? That sounds good. Great. And I just just a note that in talking about barriers, um, there are a lot of MDTs out there. We found through this study and in doing the site visits and the surveys talking with people all over the country about MDTs, we found that some teams have found solutions, some really um, uh, doable, creative solutions to the most common barriers of MDT. So I think as, as we improve the network and communication across MDTs, I think that there will be a lot more um, ability to implement and test certain solutions in different regions. Which brings me to our notable practices. Now, Zach had mentioned, we don't call these promising practices. Practices is a little bit of research ease, like that is an actual evidence base. There's a, a specific criteria that something has to meet in order to be called a promising practice in the world of research. So we're just making, we come up with our new jingle, notable practices, and they certainly are notable. These are all things that we found through the site visits. And essentially they were just interesting, unique, creative ways of doing things that seem to be, that were conducive to the functioning and sustainability of the team. So um, there's a lot of words on these slides. I'm just gonna go through these different types of practices. 
Um, first was coordinated home visits, which I've seen in an awful lot of MDTs, we, which means that in the team meeting after doing, when doing case discussion, the team makes a plan on which specific professionals to send to the home of the victim in order to get the outcome they're looking for, in order to get the result that they're looking for. And an example we had was, um, oh, a victim who was not letting APS in the house and their home was really, really badly hoarded. And so um, that team happened to have code enforcement sitting on. So they scheduled um, a home visit where code enforcement could ensure that they could get entry into the home. And at the same time, there was an APS caseworker there who ensured you know, that, that soft sort of person-centered approach to talking with the person and engaging them. Another practice was setting the meeting tone. This was really, really effective. We saw several teams where they began each case discussion, each meeting actually, by reminding the team of a set of ground rules that that this is a safe place to ask questions. There's no dumb questions. All questions are good questions. And, and also reminding people that everybody has a different perspective. Everybody's voice is important. And in order to come up with the best solution for these cases, it's important to give everybody a chance to contribute their ideas to the discussion. Also, we saw several locations, uh, two in New York, where they had hub teams, and I know there are a few others elsewhere in the, across the, the nation. And what a hub team is, is where you have a single organization that houses multiple MDTs, which means that you have one coordinator, one person who's managing, coordinating multiple teams. Um, and this, this is a neat thing for the the managers of the teams because they're able to apply things they're learning in one team to other teams that they're working in. So they're not starting from scratch, so to speak, with the team. Um, and also, the, when you've got an organization with more than one MDT coordinator, uh, they're able to talk together, share ideas, support one another, which uh, they found really, really helpful. Next. Next slide, okay, mandates. Oh, so this was an interesting one. We, we, we visited one region where they had the mandates that were, they seemed counterintuitive. They were, the, the state had mandated, or the region had mandated that APS was in charge of investigating whether or not abuse had happened. And they mandated that law enforcement would be the recipient of any suspicions of elder abuse, um, which, when that was established, law enforcement realized, well, we don't really have capacity to attend and respond to all of these elder abuse suspicions. And likewise, APS um, was in that area was not set up to do formal, thorough investigations of crimes. So what ended up happening was APS and law enforcement partnered up. And this is a um, partnership that we found in other regions is really difficult where um, maybe law enforcement doesn't necessarily see the value. They don't know much about elder abuse and they may not be willing to come to the MDT. Well, in this state, they were partners and not only were they partners, but in the years that they had spent working together, they got to be really good friends. The relationships between law enforcement officers and APS um, caseworkers was beautiful. They were very close. Another notable practice were um, Agency commitments uh, that came up in barriers. It's sometimes very difficult to get agencies to be willing to commit their their staff, their their employees to an MDT. Um, and so, in one region, we saw that they prioritized talking to the top level person, and they, the the person who uh, the supervisor of the MDT who established it, did everything she could to go as high as possible in the agency, and she. Um, leveraged her personal relationships, her relationships within other organizations to make that happen. And she's a social worker, so she used, um, she told me, I'm a social worker, so I don't give up. So she would go and go back and then go back. If they said no, or I can't look at it now, she was very, very persistent with them. Next. Uh, something else we saw in many teams was that the MDT had created a position 
within the MDT that offered um, case management. Sometimes it was longer term case management. Um, and some for some teams, this was somebody who would go out to uh, a case that the MDT was planning to review to do an intake uh, interview to get an understanding of what the situation was. This was used in very complex cases where the maybe the victim needed a little bit of extra help um, engaging in the case plan or um, or maybe um, I'm sorry, my mind just went blank. Oh, that happens sometimes. I'll just move on to the next one. Prioritizing relationships was something we saw in all of the teams. Um, and this, this was really important. Again, looking at the barriers we listed before of having challenges with sustaining the engagement and participation in members. Some teams made this such a priority that even before the first case review meeting, they brought everybody together and they set the stage for uh, cross-disciplinary learning. One team had actually hired a consultant to do team, build, team building exercises where each, each representative of the organization got to share with the rest of the um, group what it is that they wished everybody else knew about their organization. And so from the, the um, initiation of the team, they all had a sense of what each other's experience were, what their role was, and what they were bringing to the table. Next slide. Okay, so the ones, the practices I just described were universally applied to rural and urban MDTs. And now these three were used in rural teams. So we thought we'd um, share a little bit of what, what was found to be particularly successful in establishing a rural team. The first was uh, starting off a team using ad hoc meetings, meaning that there weren't regularly scheduled meetings, say every every week or every month, but it was more on an ads needed base basis. Um, and the reason why they felt this was a, a good thing to do is because folks in their community who would have to travel long distances or, or maybe their their responsibilities were spread out over uh, more than just doing elder abuse casework, it was really hard to get them to come to a regularly scheduled meeting that they didn't really understand or know the uh, benefit of. So bringing them only for meetings that they knew would be um, fruitful, that would be productive, or there was a case to review, uh, and specifically a case that needed multiple disciplines to look at it. After having that experience, a few time members were more willing to, to come to a monthly meeting. In rural teams, um, case follow-up, because the um, case volume was a little, uh, quite a bit lower than in more populated areas, they were able to do follow-up on every single case that was open with the MDT at every single meeting, uh, which meant that each of these cases were being looked at really, really closely and on a regular basis. One other thing we noticed was leveraging of relationships in rural communities. So, Folks who have stronger relationships are able to communicate more effectively on difficult cases. And sometimes communicating effectively meant being really, really direct with one another about what they thought was needed. Um, many people said, you know, they, they grew up with the people who were sitting on the MDTs. They've known each other since they were kids. So there was a level of familiarity among them that they were able to be direct with one another where it wouldn't compromise the relationship. I noted in, in areas where there's um, that are more populated, sometimes teams have the um, uh, advantage of being able to say if one member is not working with the team, well, maybe we should, you know, maybe you're not the right fit for this team. Maybe there's somebody else who would work. Rural teams did not have that um, ability because there are fewer people. Um, and sometimes, like I said, it would just be one individual who's running a whole department. So they would work it out with one another and they did it in a way that um you know rural, rural folks do or that any human being does but they just they would make it work um and that was it was neat to see next slide oh gosh so here we are at the end 
And we'd love to know from you, um, how, was this useful? How was this? Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, so before we jump into those questions, um, just want to, uh, well, thanks for going over the, all of the results, Julia. Uh, I want to raise a couple of um, additional comments um, and also respond to one question that we have in the chat box. Um, so firstly, I just want to uh, say how grateful we are uh, to ACL for supporting this work. Um, not only were we able to do this research under the auspices of the funding source um, for this project, but we were also able to support some emerging practices, which we called them, uh, that included the hub model uh, in one uh, in one team in Virginia. Uh, it included some additional resources to help support one of the uh, allied professionals. Uh, in enhancing one of the teams up in, in New York State, um, as well as supporting the case management model and uh, improving our understanding of that model. Uh, that was actually the launching pad in, in some ways for one of the APS enhancement grants that's currently underway up in Maine. Um, so all of this is very closely related um, and we really do hope and think that um, that these teams can be an important model for APS to, to use and to benefit from, as Julia was, was saying, to benefit the workers in uh, working with other professionals um, and ultimately to serving the clients better. In terms of answering uh, the question that Michael raised uh, regarding having law enforcement and prosecution in the room during discussion of criminal cases, that is an issue that's been discussed a lot. Um, I wouldn't say there are any best practices yet. Uh, the issue is that um, anything that they hear can be assumed to be relevant for discovery uh, during the actual prosecution of those criminal cases. Um, and if, if they're essentially there and they're hearing these details, then it can be uh, challenging. Um, also having anything written down in meeting minutes, et cetera, could be discoverable. Some of the the potential uh, practices we've heard about are law enforcement or prosecutors stepping out of the room or dropping off of the call uh, during part of the case conversation if there are going to be those sensitive issues discussed. Um, other possibilities are for cases to be discussed only as hypotheticals uh, without actual details of the case being raised in relation to the actual individuals who were the victims or the perpetrators. Um, that approach can be challenging conceptually, and I don't know how viable that would be. Um, but unfortunately, there's no one clear best practice at the moment um, in response to, to that challenge. So with, with those being said, um, I think we will turn it over to the questions that Julia was raising. Um, so if, if anybody has any thoughts on how you might be able to apply what we've presented within your state, or if there are any other uh, questions that you would like answered to help improve your knowledge about MDTs or additional information that would be helpful for future projects um, to help you really get the building blocks that you would need to implement MDTs in your state. We would love to hear about that and also um, open to any questions that might have come up along the way that, uh, that haven't been raised yet. And if there are questions, please feel free to jump off mute or uh, or um, uh, to put a, a comment in the chat box. Oh, we have a, a comment from Hillary, which um, yeah, is very helpful with regards to the privacy question. Right, so Hillary raises an important issue, um, not only with regards to the discussion of case details um, that, that become challenging with regards to discovery, um, but also with regards to a concern that's been raised by some people within the field surrounding obtaining consent from the, uh, from the victims, from the clients involved in the case, 
before their case is discussed um, with, with others and before their case might be brought to uh, an MDT meeting. Um, so by talking without divulging names, uh, by talking without the specific details involved in the case being raised, that can get around that issue as well, um, which, which can be important. Um, we don't have, uh, we didn't present on data from this project surrounding um, the request, uh, surrounding whether teams request consent of clients before the cases are presented. Um, I think that would be a very interesting and important uh, next step to really get a better handle on that question um, because it, it is, I think, an emerging issue and a, a topic of increasing importance for people across the field. Um, yeah, please. Yeah, this is Michael in Montana, um, kind of following up on, and thank you for answering my other one, the prosecution, because that's always a, a difficult situation. Um, the other part was looking at this model and the information folks are talking about. And when I followed on one of the links, they're creating an elder abuse forensic center. That on there is a 2003 uh, by Nova, it looks like. Um, do we have something current and some guidelines for that? Um, there, uh, so with regards to the the best structures for for MDTs, um, there's some information on the MDT TA Center, I think, that would be more recent than 2003. Um, I'm not sure exactly the year, but they they do tend to update their materials quite regularly um, and provide best practices for uh, for the kind of governance documents for meeting process, etc. Um, that would probably be the the best place that I would advise to look um, to get at, uh, at, at a good framework. Um, additionally, uh, as kind of an example of how a meeting might work, um, there was a, a video that was put out in LA County just kind of having an example meeting uh, so that people can get a flavor for how they might work. Um, that was done about eight years ago, I think. Um, and there was recently another video that's been prepared by the uh, MDT training and TA center that should be released showing how these these meetings might work over video, uh, which is a, an emerging challenge for people across the field. Um, we received also a question about indicators of success, um, particularly indicators of success for the MDTs. So in our previous work that we did evaluating the elder, elder Abuse Forensic Center model, we used three key metrics. One was prosecution, the second was conservatorship, and the third was recurrence. Um, so we entered into that project uh, just over a decade ago now, um, and we were using the best approaches at the time. At this point, I don't know if we would consider those to be outcomes, certainly. Uh, they are outputs, but they're not outputs that are universally appropriate for every case. So that's a very important uh, consideration. With regards to conservatorship or guardianship especially, um, while, while that is certainly something that um, may be appropriate for some of the cases that will come through the MDT or Forensic Center or APS more generally, um, it's also very useful we find to have, uh, to have team members apprised of alternatives to guardianship. Uh, supportive decision-making models um, and other mechanisms that can help them to, um, just as with, with other APS practice, they can help them to, uh, to thrive on their own and, and make decisions whenever it is, uh, it is possible, uh, make their own decisions as opposed to having a substitute decision-maker brought in. I think we just have Back. another minute, so probably not enough yeah. time for another question. Go ahead, Leslie. I was gonna say, can we um, go ahead and get to your last slide so that I don't want the system to cut off on us? Oh, absolutely. Um, just uh, team information, a huge thank you to our, our entire team. Um, the work we presented today was very much a group effort, um, especially done by uh, Julia and Harrison. They did a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, and we will be publishing more, uh, both within the academic literature and be sending out briefs to the field uh, within the near future. So keep an eye out for that and feel free to get in touch with any questions that you all might have. Thank you so much for attending today.
um, and for your input and feedback. And we look forward to talking through these issues more with you all in the future. Thanks so much. Okay. We want to thank Zach and Julia for their presentation today and thank everyone who participated and listened. We appreciate your questions. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the TARC and we will see you tomorrow, hopefully for our final webinar on improving the quantity and quality of NAMERS data. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful afternoon.